My name is Sanjay Gupta, I'm a cardiologist in York and today's video is on the subject of heart failure. Uh, this video is entitled Heart Failure Enter the Emperor. <laughs> right, heart failure is a clinical syndrome where the heart fails to, meet, to pump out enough blood to meet the body's requirements and in particular this happens when the body's requirements are heightened. This may then manifest with symptoms of breathlessness, tiredness and exercise intolerance. Virtually all forms of heart disease, if left unchecked, will lead to heart failure. So if a patient has high blood pressure for a very long time and you don't do anything about it, then eventually the patient will develop heart failure. Similarly, if a person has had a heart attack, well, they've damaged the heart. If uh, that is left unchecked, if that is left untreated, then the person will eventually develop heart failure. Um, and it is also true to say that patients who have heart failure will generally not have as good a quality of life as patients who don't have heart failure. And more importantly, patients who have heart failure are more likely to have an adverse prognosis compared to patients who don't have heart failure. So that would include repeated hospitalizations, um, you know, increased frailty and especially premature death. So how do we clinically as doctors recognize heart failure? Usually uh, we are first alerted to the presence of heart failure because of what the patient tells us and patients would usually complain of symptoms of progressive breathlessness, exercise intolerance, tiredness, and when you examine the patient, you will see evidence of volume overload or congestion, meaning that uh, you will see that they're swelling up with fluids, particularly the legs, particularly the ankles. The ankles start swelling up. Actually, if you press into the ankle, you'll see that the swelling pits and you are left with an indentation. And this is known as peripheral edema. So patients will complain of progressive breathlessness, they'll be more tired, they may not be able to do as much, they'd have to stop because they're getting more breathless, they may complain of breathlessness when lying flat, and they will complain of peripheral edema, which gets worse as the heart failure status gets worse. So once we come across a patient like that, how do we investigate to confirm or refute a diagnosis of heart failure? And the most used test to make a diagnosis is an ultrasound of the heart, which is otherwise known as an echocardiogram. Uh, and this allows us to visualize the heart as it contracts and relaxes. And the way to assess how well the heart is functioning or pumping blood out is by calculating something called the ejection fraction on the echocardiogram. And this is a very crude measurement, uh, but in essence, the way it's done is that we have the picture of the heart moving and what we do is we freeze the image when the heart is at its biggest so as full as it can be with blood and what we then do is once you've got that image you draw a little uh, circle around where you think the cavity of the heart is that then tells you how much blood is in the heart in essence and then you scroll uh, the images to the point where the heart then becomes the smallest and you do the same thing again and then what you do is you take the smaller value out of the bigger value divide the difference by the bigger value and multiply it by a hundred and that gives you this figure known as the ejection fraction and normally the ejection fraction is around about 60 percent in normal healthy individuals so the lower the ejection fraction, the more severely the heart has been affected, the more severe the heart failure. Okay, so that, that is how we calculate the ejection fraction. And over a course of several, you know, several decades, doctors have become very reliant on echocardiography as a means of diagnosing heart failure. And so if the ejection fraction is reduced, the patient would be termed as or would be diagnosed with heart failure. If the ejection fraction looked normal, then you would be told you don't have heart failure and you should go and get checked out for some other cause of why you were getting your symptoms, be that 
lung disease, be that um, sleep apnea, be that you know uncontrolled high blood pressure, something like that. Uh, and therefore, and and the general feeling was that those people who had reduced ejection fractions were at a higher risk, and they were obviously the more seriously affected patients, and they needed more attention. And the patients who did have who didn't have a reduced ejection fraction were not at such a great risk, and they could therefore be discharged. And therefore, most of the research in heart failure was done on those people who had a reduced ejection fraction. So they were told that you know those were the people who made it onto the studies because they had that is how heart failure was defined: a reduction in the ejection fraction. Um, and so a lot of research was done in these people with reduced ejection fractions. And with all the research that's been done, it's become apparent that there are certain medications that can be given which can actually improve quality of life, but more importantly, improve prognosis in people with heart failure and a reduced ejection fraction. These medications include ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, aldosterone antagonists, etc. Over the course of the past sort of decade or so, it has become increasingly apparent that even those patients who clinically seemed like they had heart failure, breathless, exercise intolerance, leg swelling, but when you did an echocardiogram, you found that their ejection fraction was normal, not reduced. Well, these guys didn't have a great prognosis either. It seemed they also had all the things that happened to people with reduced ejection fractions. They would have more hospitalizations, they would have a reduced quality of life, and they also would have reduced life expectancy. And this was a really gr big group of the population, you know, large population, and they took a, up a large amount of healthcare resources. But they weren't at that time termed as having heart failure. And over time, researchers started realizing that perhaps we were mistakenly over-reliant on echocardiography as the arbiter of making the diagnosis of heart failure. Perhaps the echocardiogram was helpful in telling us who had a reduced ejection fraction and therefore helped us identify those patients who could benefit from the medications that have been shown to be beneficial from the clinical trials like the ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, etc. But perhaps the echocardiogram didn't tell us whether that patient had heart failure. It just told us about that group of patients who were more likely to benefit from the medications, the reduced ejection fraction. Um, and perhaps the echo is too crude to tell us about the overall function of the heart. And there are lots of reasons why the echo may not be the ideal test to tell you about heart function. Because firstly, you see the heart is a complex three-dimensional structure. And therefore, it would seem amateurish almost to sort of just have a two-dimensional image on a screen and try and draw a circle and say, use that as the as the be-all and end-all of working out how this complex three-dimensional structure is working and how it's pumping blood out. The heart will pump um, uh, longitudinally, it'll pump um, uh, radially, and it will also twist. And when we're looking at the echocardiogram, we're only looking at radial function. We're not really assessing uh, function longitudinally or this kind of twisting effect of the heart, all of which contribute to heart function. So you may have impaired function of the heart, but because what we're measuring is only one dimension, uh, we could be misled into thinking that the heart function was normal. Uh, and then the second thing that is really important to note is that we've always tended to focus on the contraction of the heart, uh, but we never really studied the relaxation of the heart on an, echo, on an echocardiogram. So we were interested, or we have always been interested, the heart looks this big, if it comes like this, well, that means that the heart is contracting well. The problem is that if there were a problem with the relaxation of the heart, if the heart wasn't relaxing, then it would fill with less blood. And so even though it may contract well, it is still pumping less blood out. So you know, traditionally on echocardiography, we have not really studied the relaxation function of the heart as well as the contraction bit of the heart. And if there was a problem with the relaxation of the heart, then the, the, the function may look normal, but the heart is still pumping out less blood because it's getting less time to fill with blood because it's stiffer. And so this would explain why some people would have symptoms of heart failure, would behave as if they have heart failure, 
but when you did their echocardiogram, their systolic function would be normal. And this would, and therefore, increasingly people started no taking notice of this population of patients and they gave it, they gave them a new term, a new diagnosis. And they called these patients who had all the symptoms of heart failure as, but had normal ejection fraction as heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or HEFPEF, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So a new group of patients was identified who had heart failure, but on echo, their function looked normal. Once this condition was recognized as an important clinical identity, uh, clinical entity which affected quality of life and quantity of life badly, the next step was to find out whether the medications that had been shown to prolong life in patients with heart failure and a reduced ejection fraction could actually also prolong life in patients with heart failure who actually had preserved ejection fraction. And unfortunately, the studies were done, but the results were universally underwhelming. And therefore, we identified that although there was this group of patients who were struggling, who were going to have a poorer prognosis, the medications that we had traditionally used for heart failure didn't seem to make a big difference to prognosis in this particular group. And therefore, these unfortunate patients were still discharged and were left to struggle with their symptoms, have repeated hospital ad um, admissions with progressive leg swelling, which would make them weaker and frailer. And then eventually those patients would die prematurely. That was until now for I'm very excited to tell you of a new set of medications called SGLT2 inhibitors that have actually for the first time been shown to improve prognosis in patients with HEFPEF, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Now, SGLT2 inhibitors are anti-diabetic drugs, which have only really gained prominence over the past five to 10 years because they were shown in diabetic studies to reduce the development of heart failure in patients with diabetes. Because researchers got interested in this idea that they reduced heart failure, they decided to study them in patients with heart failure. And they said, well, could these medications actually improve prognosis, reduce progression of heart failure in people who already have heart failure? And what they found was that indeed, these medications seem to reduce progression and improve prognosis in patients who had heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And that benefit was seen irrespective of whether the patient had diabetes or not. So all patients with reduced ejection fraction uh, <clears throat> would potentially benefit from these medications uh, in terms of prognosis. And <clears throat> there are two such agents which are now commonly being used. One is called dapagliflozin, the other is called empagliflozin. And they are now routinely given to all patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction as standard therapy because of the prognostic benefits that have been documented. So anyone who is watching this who has heart failure and is found to have a reduced ejection fraction, and if you're not taking an SGLT2 inhibitor, then it is very much advisable to go and see your doctor and ask him why you're not on it. But we're talking about patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And so given the benefits seen in those patients who had a reduced ejection fraction, the next step was to see whether these agents could help patients with preserved ejection fraction. And this led to the Emperor Preserved Study. And the results of the Emperor Preserved Study were published in the New England Journal of Medicine last year. And this was a double-blind placebo-controlled study where the investigators randomly assigned 5,988 patients with symptomatic heart failure. But these patients had an ejection fraction of more than 40%. So their ejection fraction was better uh, compared to patients in general who were studied in uh, the reduced ejection fraction studies. And these patients were then randomized to either receive placebo or an SGLT2 inhibitor called empagliflozin at a dose of 10 milligrams daily, in addition to usual therapy. And the researchers wanted to study whether the addition of empagliflozin helped in reducing hospitalizations for heart failure or death for cardiovascular causes. 
And the results were very interesting because they, over a me median period of 26.2 months, um, it was noted that an outcome occurred in 415 of 2,997 patients who were taking the drug empagliflozin and 511 out of 299, uh, 2, uh, 2,991 patients on placebo. So 13.8% of patients in the in the medication arm, empagliflozin arm, had to be hospitalized or died due to cardiovascular causes in comparison with 17.1% in patients who were taking placebo. So the number needed to treat was around about 31. If you treated 31 patients with, um, with heart failure, despite a normal ejection fraction or uh, 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 without a, a normal ejection fraction on the echo. If you treated 31 patients for 26.2 months, then you would save one person from either a hospitalization or death due to um, heart failure, due to cardiovascular causes. Much of the benefit in this study was largely driven by reduced hospitalizations rather than death, but even reduced hospitalizations is uh, a benefit very uh, much worth considering because hospitalization is in general a bad thing. It takes a lot out of the patient. It's very distressing. It contributes to deconditioning and frailty. It exposes you to the risk of infections and falls, etc. This particular study, the Emperor Preserve study, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine on the 14th of October, 2021. So it's fairly new. And the lead author is Professor Stefan Anker. So if you get a chance, do check it out, but it's really interesting. So the main points that I wanted to make are, number one, the diagnosis of heart failure is a clinical diagnosis. Echocardiography can tell you if you have a significantly reduced ejection fraction, but even if your ejection fraction is not reduced, you can still have heart failure. Number two, SGLT2 inhibitors are an exceptionally interesting new class of agent, which may help in terms of improving prognosis in patients with heart failure, regardless now of ejection fraction. So they have definitely been shown to re improve prognosis in people with reduced ejection fraction. And now we have a study which suggests that they may even help patients with uh, preserved ejection fraction. So this is the first agent that is um, now available and is being used which can help people who have heart failure symptoms, even though their ejection fraction is not reduced on an, ec on an echocardiogram. And this is important. It's important because, you know, it may take another 10 years uh, for this medication to be given um, routinely in these patients. And I'm very keen that anyone who's watching this can now take this information and go and have a discussion with their GP or their cardiologist and say, would I be eligible for it? Anyway, I hope you found this useful uh, and I wish you a lovely weekend.